Oh. Hi, everyone. Oh, it, wor it works. Excellent. So, uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here and to talk to you here today. I want to take this opportunity to thank Ton and the Blender Institute for inviting me. Excellent. So, my name is Daniel Bistet, and I work as lead creature artist and head of modeling at Goodbye Cancer Studios in Stockholm. And during the development phase of 2.8, I did a bunch of Blender, EV demos, demos, and like personal art for the Blender Institute. So I'm here to talk about the uh, sort of creative process there. So first, I wanted to just briefly mention where I work. Goodbye Kansas is a VFX studio, and we have our headquarters in Stockholm in Sweden. But we also have um, offices in Hamburg, London, and Los Angeles. And we use a bunch of different 3D applications, and Blender is one of them. And we mainly have used it for things like layout, modeling, concept, grooming, and to some extent, even texturing. So we do game cinematics, both real-time and uh, pre-rendered. We do VFX for film, TV, and commercials, motion capture and facial performance capture, and also facial rigs for external clients, and visual development, IP development, and storytelling. So I wanted to show some recent productions as well. So here we have uh, Cyberpunk. This is, uh, ah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this was a game trailer that we did for an upcoming action RPG game from CD Project Red. So, ah, very excited about the release of that. Uh, we have, oh, yeah, Hellboy. Uh, this was a feature film that came out earlier this year, and we did a lot of shots at the end of the movie. And uh, we've done numerous shots for this TV show, uh, The Walking Dead, over the years. And, you know, working with blood, gore, and zombies is uh, something that we, we love and adore. Uh, Troll, this was released at GDC earlier this year, and this was a tech demo that we did for Epic's Unreal Engine. So this is all done in real time. So... Um, for this project, we created five different game trailers that told the story of the four main characters for the game Over Kills the Walking Dead, which is a four-player co-op game. So I wanted to show just a like, little montage of my Blender artwork, or um, a bit of my Blender artwork, at least. Here we go. Sound. Is there any sound? No? <laughs> it's not the end of the world. You can listen to me. Yeah. Uh, it was fun. Uh, tree creature. This was like. Uh, first off, when it was possible to animate and uh, deform objects within Blender 2.8. This is a target I did. Um, really wanted to try out, you know, pushing the limits of Eevee with fur as well. So it's like, I don't know, millions of hair strands there. This was a good night, Claire. A uh, lot of, it's kind of a, started out as a very small project that just bloated. Now, add a little of this, add a little of that. And this is a tiger as well. We'll be talking a bit about the shading there later on. Yeah. I just got to say, it's uh, amazing to work in, in Blender and the EV viewport, like seeing the something that is so, you know, to something, a final result directly in the viewport. Super inspiring. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I wanted to talk about uh, pipeline and scene structure. So, first off, this is uh, more of a simplified view of a classical studio pipeline. So here on the left, uh, we have a bunch of assets 
This is like models, so for instance, a door over here. And uh, all of these assets are contained within separate files. And then the artist publishes different versions of these as the, he or she improves the object. And then the assets are brought into the layout and placed accordingly. And then the layout artist sort of um, publishes new versions. And then it's brought into uh, lighting and render. So the advantages of working like this is that it's very suitable for a big number of artists. And since all the assets are in their separate files, there's a very low risk that multiple artists need to access the same file at once. And it's very structured, so that's cool. Uh, there are some disadvantages, though, and it's kind of a slow workflow. And there's a lot of logistics since you have to jump in between different files and stuff like that. So when I'm doing personal artwork, I tend to simplify this sort of pipeline a bit. So this orange box uh, represents my sort of assets uh, Blender file. So here I have all of my assets uh, that I want to create. And the door, for instance, is consisting of several objects with different materials. And then I put that in a collection. And then all of these separate asset collections are put in a main collection. And this main collection sort of asks, uh, acts as a package that I can uh, link into other files. So then on the to my left, I have the room layout. And then I link in the main collection. So that's sort of just like a <laughs> dump in there. And then I can access the separate small uh, collections and place them. So the advantages here is that it's pretty flexible and fast. It's very suitable for a small team or one person. And it's great that I can you know, have shared materials between these uh, different assets as well and see them update in real time. And it's very easy to keep track of which asset I want to bring into the room layout. <coughs> so the disadvantages here is that it's not very suitable for a large number of artists since multiple artists might want to access this asset blender file at once. But then you can sort of break it out into separate files as well. So with more complex assets, like this um, character Claire here, um, it's consisting of uh, geometry, textures, shading, uh, a rig, and an animation. Then I put that in a collection and link the collection into the room layout. And uh, then if I want to do additional animation, I can, there should be an arrow here somewhere, OK. So um, if I want to do additional animation of that rig within the room layout file, <coughs> I can just use make proxy. Now, this is fun, because I handed in these slides on Sunday. And on Monday, it was like, oh, now we have a uh, library override. So that's Blender development for you. That's uh, amazing. Improvements all the time. Uh, I also work with kind of a push workflow. So uh, my source files, so the asset uh, file here, for instance, I always link in the same file. So I never have to uh, relocate it and stuff like that. And if I need to save out versions, I just save them out as a copy so that I can go back if I need to. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I have to just uh, say that I put in a bit too much information in this presentation. So uh, we have to pause a bit. And I might uh, run over 30 minutes. Who knows? OK. So here we have the asset file. And uh, as you can see up there in the uh, outliner, I have uh, separate collections for each object. And it's contained within a main collection called assets. And here is the layout file. And it's quite empty now, as you can see. And now I need to dump the assets in here. So I create a new scene. And uh, then I just link the asset file, go to the collection, and bring in the assets. So what I see now is just one locator with all the, the assets appear to be sort of merged. But what really happens is now I suddenly have uh, access to the individual uh, collections. So that's really handy for me. And now I just yeah, go on and populate the scene. And yeah, 
So it's very easy for me to filter out the assets as well if I use a prefix. And here is the prefix AST. Now I just place these, and I can use uh, snapping as well, snap to face, and orient the objects to the face normal as well. That really helps. Yeah, so this is uh, just a really fun way to work where you have the lighting and everything within the scene, and you basically see what the, yeah, kind of the final image will look like. Um, there's also this thing where you have uh, these big mechanical arms that have animation from the source files. And uh, I mean, that's kind of handy if I make a loop, then they just play and go around. But it's the same thing as with the character. Uh, if I want to replace that anim animation, I can just uh, do library overrides on the armature and do a unique animation for this shot. Oh, yeah. Uh, pause. OK, great. So here I'm just going to show a, an example of where I use um, nested collections. So I'm going to create this fantastic snowman here. And we're going to make um, separate variations of the snowman. Like we're going to have a snowman base, and then a snowman with a top hat, and a snowman with a, a party hat as well. So play. So here I'm just creating the uh, asset really quick. Uh, this is great stuff, super inspiring, yeah. <laughs> Just add some quick materials. Uh, so then I just select the base of the snowman, create a new collection called the snowman base. Now I put the 3D locator there and a pause. Thank you, I was a bit too fast there. So basically I put the 3D locator at the base of the snowman and then in the object settings, I can go into uh, the, the collection settings and choose uh, set offset from 3D cursor. And that means that when I create a collection instance of this, the, uh, the, the origin of the collection will be sort of where I intend it to be, like in the base of the foot of the snowman. Play. OK, so now I create an instance of the snowman base. And then I just you know, duplicate that hat, put it on top. Now I select the hat and the base of the snowman and create a new asset called snowman uh, top hat. Create a new asset called, <laughs> and create the party hat there, create the asset, and pause. So the advantage here is that I, if I want to add you know, a third eye or a bigger nose or something, this will ripple out to all of the different versions of the snowman. So that's uh, super nice. You can just create something very basic at first, and then go back and sort of uh, create more detail, and then it ripples out into all these different collections. Play. So now I'm back into, no, sorry. Here I put those snowman assets into the main collection. And now I'm in the layout scene. And as you can see, it has updated and the snowmen are there. And here are the settings for the collection, or sorry, the source file, if you need to uh, reload that or relocate it. And now I can suddenly just yeah, find my snowman assets and place them in the scene. And if I want to replace this collection with the uh, one with a party hat, I can just go into the object settings in the collection and uh, change to another, uh, another collection. So that's super handy as well. So imagine like you're doing a forest. You just have 100% trees at first, and then you can randomly select a bunch of these trees and um, choose another collection, sort of a bush instead. And that's a way you can yeah, just change the scene as you progress. OK. <laughs> Woo! So much talking in so little time. OK, I wanted to talk about sort of my mindset and uh, time constraints when working in uh, personal projects. So one problem is that I need to create a lot of content in a short amount of time. And some of the solutions are that I try to cut corners and cheat as much as I can. 
Um, so every aspect of your project doesn't need to be perfect, but if you just start with a very basic uh, idea, you sort of free up time, and you can put that time into the assets and objects that are most visible in your scene later on. You don't want to spend, you know, five days on, you know, a screw that is like in the corner of your camera view. So what I do is I create stuff very simple at first, and then I iterate. So this tree creature, inst uh, for instance, <coughs> the mesh to the left there is very just like raw and uh, not pretty at all. But I can still, you know, decimate it, bring it into a Blender file, rig it up since if I have locked joint positions, and then I can animate it. And then I'm like, huh, I want to, you know, improve it, and then go back to the modeling phase, improve it, bring it into the rig scene, and just transfer the skin weights. So. Um, Here's something that is important. Uh, evaluate things in context. So if uh, your shot is going to look like the image to the left here, the, the eagle is very small in frame, you don't want to you know, be very, you don't want to sit close and like, oh, put amazing amount of details in the feathers and stuff like that. Another thing I do to save time is that I avoid UVs as much as I can when it comes to environment and non-deforming props. So I use uh, triplanar mapping as much as I can. This is uh, a thing called box mapping in Blender, but like in other software, it's uh, known as triplanar mapping. And I will go over that at the end of the presentation. I also do a lot of, like, uh, use auto remesh tools as much as I can. So sculpting is just like, I just have a very rough mesh. I don't care about topology at all, just woo -hoo. And then I order a mesh with either C remesh or in ZBrush, and now we have the quad remesh add-on in Blender, and uh, you know also quad remesh that is implemented in Blender 2.81 as well. And then when you have an order mesh, you can just go in and fix the areas that are not working out really well. And usually this is stuff like face, hands, uh, feet, that kind of thing. And also, don't be too afraid of triangles and n-gons. Uh, I've done my fair share of rigging in my days, so I can say that as long as something looks good and deforms good, it's okay. Sometimes, I, I'm not saying that people should use bad topology all the time, um, but it's also important to think about when it's okay to use it, and sometimes you really have to, to make it work. So, Tiger Shader, I just wanted to go over this, uh, like a very brief overview of how I created that effect. So it's basically having these uh, color fields where they appear to be moving across the surface of the tiger. So it's a rather simple idea, really. Um, you can see here that I have the tiger and I have created a hand-painted texture, which consists of, it's basically an ID texture, so it's painted in R, G, and B, red, blue, green, and blue. And it's just a very normal UV layout, and here you can see the texture as well. So I also created a secondary UV set, where I took a copy of the tiger, just folded up the arms, uh, sorry, the legs, uh, to the back and straightened out the tail, and then if I put in a, like an arrow texture on this one for the, this side projection, the arrow sort of appears to be flowing through the shape of the tiger. So here you can see me. Um, I have the arrow texture. And if I use the mapping node and move it, the uh, texture appeared to be moving through the surface of the tiger. So here I'm just adding a uh, noise texture and con um, adding the contrast a bit. Putting in a mix node. Pause. Pause. Pause! Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, so mapping um, can also be seen like, it can be X, Y, and Z, right? But it can also be seen as colors, red, green, and blue. So if I put a mix node, where put it to add and just add a green value, it basically moves, um, it, the texture appears to be moving up and down in UV space. So I can use this to sort of deform the texture as it moves through the tiger. Play! 
Great. So as you can see, when I drive the slider there, it appears to be moving up and down. So I can add a noise texture. And this is consisting of three colors, right? Red, green, and blue. But I on only want to use the green values to displace the texture. So I multiply the noise texture with green. So there's no red or blue information. And now uh, it's just displacing a bit too much. So I'm adding a uh, math node and just offsetting these values minus 0.5. So now you can see with the error texture that it sort of deforms a bit as uh, it will move through the uh, surface of the tiger. So this sort of way of working is just to add some more interesting uh, uh, deformation to the noise texture. Yep, so here I have the ID texture that I painted earlier, and I'm just separating out the red channel here. I'm just adding a mix node and uh, connecting the uh, noise texture to that mix node. So I'm basically multiplying the red channel of the ID texture with the noise texture, right? And then I um, slide the mapping. And uh, now in Blender 2.81, we suddenly have access to, OK, pause. Thank you. Uh, we suddenly have access to uh, time offsets in uh, noise textures as well. So that's really handy for just creating uh, variants of noise as well. So, and here on the uh, left there, I have something, a little node that's kind of out of frame that says uh, my time. And it's basically just a value that is keyed to match the current frame of the time slider. And then I multiply that with minus 0 0.1. So I, if I just connect uh, the time to the mapping of the texture of the tiger, the, the, the texture will appear to be moving forward, right? So I have to make it move the other way. So that's why the minus 1. And then I just combine this to uh, XYZ vector and plug it into the location. Um, OK, play. Wait a minute. OK, pause, pause, pause. Oh, thank you. So great. So now I have the basic setup of how it's going to work with one of the ID channels, right? The red channel plus the noise texture. Now I have this great setup there. And I can just group it to one of these uh, group nodes in uh, Blender's uh, shading system. OK, play. Great. So that's the uh, node group that I get. And I just change the um, input values to the first one is frame, and the second one is offset. And the offset is just changing the time of the uh, noise texture, basically. So what am I doing now? So now I have to do the same setup for the green channel, right? And since I've already created a node group of the basic setup, I can just combine the, uh, the ID of the green channel, uh, sorry, the green channel, the ID texture, with the noise texture. And here I'm just realizing, oh, I forgot to uh, disconnect that arrow texture. So I'm making sure that I get uh, the noise texture as an output. And then I can just, now I have the red channel and the green channel fixed. So I just combine those with a mix node by using add. Cool. So now I just need to add the, uh, oh yeah, and now I'm thinking, oh, it moves a bit too fast. Now I can just use a multiply value and just lower that value that multiplies so the noise texture doesn't move as fast to the tiger. Okay, just uh, selecting those, duplicating, and multiplying again the blue channel with the animated noise, and combining it with the rest of the channels with a mix node that is set to add. And now uh, I just tidy it up a bit so it's more clean and visible what I'm doing with uh, each of the different node sets. So now I basically have this mask, right? consisting of different IDs and different noises. And I can multiply 
each of these masks with the color that I choose, and you basically get this sort of effect. And then I just create an emission node, pipe in these uh, color um, <laughs> values, and combine it with uh, just a normal BSDF shader that is black. And now I see it in the, you know, the amazing EV viewport, just seeing uh, everything moving. Oh, and pause. Yeah, I realized I made a mistake here. So the, the noise is not moving perfectly in the x-axis. It's also moving up, right? So I realized I had, um, by accident, connected it to the y uh, in the combine xyz node there. Uh, play. Yep, so now I can drag the time slider. Everything moves to the tiger. Very cool. Uh, it's just amazing to you know work in this sort of an environment. Uh, just you know having the animation playing in real time, having the shading, the noise moving in real, in real time as well. Ah, <laughs> thank you. Am I way over time-wise? It's all good. Okay, great. This is the final thing. So I'm going to go over triplanar mapping, or box mapping, as it's called in Blender. And this is something that is really useful for uh, objects that are not deforming, basically. So it could be you know, pillars, environment stuff. It works great with scaling, rotating, and translating. Uh, but this particular setup will sort of have texture sliding if you start deforming your model. So here's the same uh, model on the left and the right side. It doesn't have any UVs whatsoever. The left one is textured mapped by UVs, and the right one is textured mapped by using the object uh, output and using box uh, mapping in the texture node. So you see that it's just like, yeah, working off the bat. So the main idea is to have, uh, from the texture coordinate, you put, take the object output, and then you yeah, usually have a mapping node, right, for scaling it and stuff like that. And then you put it into the texture node, into the vector input, and then you change it to box and you adjust the blend so you don't get any hard edges where the uh, different axes meet, basically. So here's an example. I have this model, just adding some kind of mat uh, metal shader. And I'm using the object output connecting it to a uh, mapping node, changing the texture to using box. And now I can scale it. And I just add a color ramp and you know, uh, crank up the contrast a bit. And you can see there how there's a line. And if I use blend, it just blends super nice. And I connect that to the roughness of the shader and just adjust the values so it gets something that looks a little bit more appealing. And what do we have here? Yeah, I'm going to create some kind of very simple rust shader as well. Just connect the same texture. And in the color ramp, I just change it so it looks more like a rust kind of um, color values. Then I connect the color, output of the color to the base color, right? So now we get something that looks somewhat decent. And I can uh, combine these two shaders with a mix node and either show the uh, metal shader or the rust shader, right? So now I just take another color ramp, create a very uh, contrasty look, and I can use this as a mask and put it into the factor of the mix node and thereby um, combining these two shaders. And I, uh, you know, I haven't done any UVs. I haven't done any hand painted texture. It's just off the bat, very fast. And you can do this kind of shading as complex as you want. And once you've done it, you can just replicate it to other objects in your scene. So here I'm just using the ambient occlusion node, um, which uh, amazingly enough works in Eevee. And I can use that output as a mask and combine it with the. Uh, the rust or the blending mask, just contrast it up. So this means that I get more rust where you have more ambient occlusion, basically. 
And this setup works both in Blender and Cycles as well. Yep. And then you just, yeah, adjust the uh, values. And, and this is usually how I start, just something very basic, and then you add features on top of the shading. Um, of course, this is a very basic setup, but it's super useful. Oh, that's the end of my presentation. Okay.